Hello and welcome back to Dear Old State Update, brought to you by Penn State Sports Night. I'm Gianna Kataya, joined alongside Justin Chevalella. The fall athletic season is beginning to wrap up while the winter season is just about to get going and our beat reporters have been out and about covering all things Penn State sports. And Gianna, while the fall sports seasons are wrapping up, they're also heating up with postseason play getting underway for several of Penn State's teams. But before we can get to those postseason teams, the Penn State football team, which is vying for a spot in the four-team college football playoff, hosted Indiana this past weekend. The 10th-ranked blue and white eked out a 33-24 victory with Drew Aller connecting on a 57-yard touchdown pass to Keandre Lambert-Smith late in the fourth quarter to take the lead. Kaylee Tallman and Amanda Vogt have more on the gritty, not pretty victory for Penn State. Thanks, Justin. Penn State football scraped by with a win this weekend over Indiana, a team they were expected to demolish. It was a lackluster performance at best. Drew Aller didn't look his best. The defense gave up 24 points, the most they've given up all season, and Penn State fans were left questioning the strength of this team. There were a number of things that went wrong this weekend for the Nittany Lions, which doesn't bode well for them heading into two tough games against Maryland and Michigan. Now, Amanda, honestly, this performance by the Nittany Lions really shocked me, especially after a lackluster performance against Ohio State. But honestly, I think Penn State played better in the Ohio State game, especially from a defensive perspective, than they did in this Indiana game. Because Drew Aller, I thought he needed to come out with a lot of confidence against Indiana to put up one of his best performances yet, especially after the Ohio State game. But he didn't do that. He looked nervous. And after the hate he received from the press following Ohio State, it's understandable. But he threw his first interception of the year of his career against Indiana. And also the running backs were nowhere to be seen on the offensive side. Katron Allen had a decent game with 81 yards, but Nick Singleton only had 50. This team is ranked now ninth in the country. And that performance to me did not look like a top 10 team. Well, part of the reason why this team moved up in the rank is how Drew Aller bounced back from throwing his first interception. He did set a record in the FBS with his 311 previous passing attempts to start his collegiate career before that first interception was thrown. And honestly, what's more impressive is how he did bounce back because the defense put up a key stop, which only left a three-point um, three point score to tie the game and then all Drew Aller had to do was take three plays before he found his man Keandre Lambert Smith with the 57 yard touchdown and it's impressive for the fact that explosiveness is what this team lacks. He's had those moments where he's slinging the ball and he's also had the moments where he's leaving Beaver Stadium heading to the sidelines and the fans are booing him off the field. It's a strange sight to see considering how this offense fared early on in the season but because he was able to come back in that fashion shows that there is confidence behind him. They do trust him a little bit, like Mike Yersich, to trust him a little bit more and try to add some more explosiveness because that play was proof that it worked. And as for the running backs, they did have a little bit more productivity than they did against Ohio State, 33 carries compared to the 18 they had at Ohio Stadium. And that was something Franklin talked about last week leading up to Indiana was the lack of touches that he realized the running backs had. And trying to get back to that, yes, they were stopped, but as long as they were getting more carries and trying to get some productivity. Nicholas Singleton did have the touchdown. That was the biggest beat, but the story, like you mentioned, was the defense. And as you mentioned, Penn State with the 157-yard passing play by Keandre Landerbert Smith that ended in the touchdown is proof positive that Drew Aller is capable of making those plays. So heading into Maryland and Michigan, I'd like to see Penn State try and make a couple more of those plays. Now on the defensive side, the absence of Chop Robinson I think was instrumental in Penn State's performance because they didn't put as much pressure on Indiana quarterback Brendan Soresby as they could have to maybe, like I keep saying, force a defensive turnover. But on the bright side, they had very good rush defense. The pass defense, however, two big plays that resulted in a touchdown of more than 70 yards. That's not ideal. Um, and it was the same play. It was the same play from the first one to the second one with no difference in coverage. And so that definitely needs to be improved on heading into Maryland and Michigan. Yeah, like you mentioned, Brendan Soresby actually made his collegiate debut against Penn State last season, and he came into Beaver Stadium with a lot of question marks as if he could actually throw the ball on target. There's a lot of times where we've seen him overthrow it, 
but he hit two of his receivers once for 90 yards and a second time for 69 yards on blown coverages by the defense. But other than that, other than those 14 points, the defense only gave up 10 other points. A touchdown earlier in the first quarter, in the fourth quarter, and a field goal after Drew Aller's interception. And what was so important there was that Penn State returned to its complementary football identity through the defense. The interception by Jalen Reed led to points before half, which gave Penn State its first lead of the game. And then withholding Indiana to three points after that interception was crucial to set up and not put Penn State in a deficit because that would have changed the entire game plan truly. It would have adjusted how plays are being called and where confidence lies. And when Penn State can bounce off both sides of the ball like that, that is when they are successful. And that's why in the third quarter when the defense can prevent teams from scoring like they've done all season, it allows the offense to go out there with a little more confidence that the scoreboard isn't drastically changing every time that they change possession and every time that they get the ball. But they will have to be cautious coming up next with Maryland and Michigan. And in terms of Maryland and Michigan, Maryland is a scary team for Penn State to play against. Their record does not show how good they are. Three unfortunate losses to Big Ten opponents. But Maryland went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ohio State for the entire first two quarters that they played him. And Talia Tungavailoa is an exceptional quarterback that they have there. He is second in the Big Ten in passing yards, averaging over 280 yards a game, which is dangerous against Penn State's lackluster pass defense that they showed against Indiana. And now Michigan. Michigan is just a good team. I mean, there's not much you can say about that otherwise. J.J. McCarthy's a scary quarterback. The O-line is scary good. The defense is incredible. And the running back duo is the best in the country. So I don't know how Mich or Penn State is going to fare against these two opponents. Well, it's all about defense, defense, defense. And as for Maryland, losing to Northwestern this past weekend was kind of a bit of a shock. And that's what kind of led to Penn State having to go there will make it a little bit tough environment because they're going to want to bounce back. But with Michigan, they have these two wide receivers that will make it really difficult because you see with Keandre Lambert-Smith, has he really emerged as a wide receiver one? Not really. With You look at his stats compared to the wide receiver duo that the Wolverines have. So it will be a really test of Penn State's secondary in order to get a win and try to come up with something monumental. Penn State looks ahead to battles against Maryland and Michigan before closing out the season against Rutgers and Michigan State. The state of the Nittany Lions legacy this season remains yet to be determined. Will it be another 9-3 or 10-2 season, or will Penn State pull off the 11-1 miracle? There's a lot of football left to play, and we're excited to see how this season shapes out. Back to you, Justin. Well, thanks, Kaylee and Amanda. The Nittany Lions travel to Maryland next weekend before a top-10 showdown looms with Michigan. Gianna, this past weekend's game wasn't great for the Nittany Lions. What do they have to do against Maryland this weekend and probably more importantly against Michigan in two weekends? Well, I think Penn State has the talent. All the guys out there know how to play football. It, when they come to the Big Ten games, it's their composure. I feel like that just goes right out the window and they let like the nerves and the anxiety get to them, but they just got to go out there and play their game and Penn State can be a great team and beat these top 10 opponents and these Big Ten teams without any worries. But right now, their composure isn't there, so they aren't finding success early on in these games. And I think we did see a little bit of that composure towards the end of the game the other day. Drew Aller had his first career turnover, but then he was able to recover and throw that 57-yard touchdown pass to Lambert Smith, and that really changed the game, and then the defense came to play. So I think late in the games, they find that composure for me, it's a matter of finding that composure right out of the gate, and they haven't been able to do that yet. Absolutely, I agree. The next couple of weekends will go a long way in deciding Penn State's fate this season, and we'll have to see what happens. With the football team traveling south this week, the field hockey team is going up north to Ann Arbor, Michigan for Big Ten tournament action. Although the team was on the road this weekend, our reporter Jamie DiBologna was there for the final two home games a week prior, the then now number 16 ranked Nittany Lions lost to Northwestern 2-0 before bouncing back for a senior day upset victory over number 5 Iowa. Let's take a look. This past Sunday on October 22nd, the women's field hockey team ranked number 16 took on the Iowa Hawkeyes number 5. This game celebrated senior day for the five seniors on the team. Coming out strong, the Hawkeyes scored quickly within the first half. 
It was a physical and fast-paced game. Penn State won over the possession battle, gaining possession for most of the time. Both goalies had multiple tough saves throughout the entirety of the game. The Nittany Lions capitalized on the penalty corners, which gave them their first score of the game by Fia Gladia. Going into halftime, the teams were tied 1-1. The Nittany Lions went into halftime tied 1-1 to the Iowa Hawkeyes. They came back out and Carly Gannon, senior, on her senior day, ended up scoring the game-winning goal in the third quarter. After the game, the goal was corrected to Fia Gladia, second of the game. Penn State continued to fight on and defend their lead. For Penn State Sports Night, I'm Jamie DeBologna. After that win over Iowa, the Nittany Lions took the road to face Indiana, where they picked up a 3-1 victory to round out their regular season on a two-game winning streak. They'll play Ohio State on Thursday as the 2023 Big Ten Tournament begins. Justin, what will the team have to do to be successful in this tournament? Well, they have to rely on their veteran presences on the team. Fia Gladio is one of the best field hockey players in the Big Ten, one of the best in Penn State history as well. She leads the team in goals right now, and she's a catalyst for that offense. I was also at that Iowa game that Jamie was at, and she was the reason they won that game. She scored both of their goals. Now, it was a little finicky. The first one originally credited to Carly Gannon, and then they switched it over to Gladio. But at the end of it, she's the catalyst for their offense. And on the defensive side, Bree Baracco, the graduate student in net or in the cage, pardon me, for this team, she needs to come up big as she has all season long for a team that defensively is a little bit weaker than they have been in the past, and she's been there rock solid when they've needed her this season. Penn State field hockey was knocked out early in the Big Ten tournament last year, but made it to the NCAA national semifinal game before losing to the eventual champions, the Tar Heels of North Carolina. Under first-year head coach Lisa Bervinchak love the Nittany Lions will look for some more success in the Big Ten tournament this season. From one team in the Big Ten tournament to two more, Penn State women's soccer took a 3-0 Big Ten quarterfinal victory over number 24 Indiana on Sunday, while the men's team won a share of the Big Ten regular season title with a draw on Sunday with Wisconsin and will start tournament play on Friday against Rutgers. Let's take a look at the men's team regular season home finale last Wednesday. Our Josh Gabriel was there. Let's take a look. In their last home game of the regular season, the Penn State Nittany Lions men's soccer team played host to the Detroit Mercy Titans at Jeffrey Field. The Nittany Lions drew first blood in the fifth minute with a penalty kick goal from Big Ten leading scorer Peter Mangione. The remainder of the first half was dominated by the home team as PSU had a plethora of attempts to add to their early score but came up just short on each of their attempts. At the intermission, the Nittany Lions still led 1-0. After the break, though, they would come out firing in the second half with Femi Oedesu and Matthew Henderson scoring a goal apiece in the first 10 minutes of play to spark Penn State to their eventual 3-0 victory by the 55th minute. Henderson's goal was the first of his collegiate career. Chris Shakes and the defense held down their back line like we've seen before as the Nittany Lions defense came away with their eighth clean sheet in 15 games played. The Nittany Lions ended their regular season on the road with a 1-1 draw at Wisconsin It will open up Big Ten tournament play at home on Friday versus Rutgers in the quarterfinals. Both Penn State men's and women's soccer regular seasons have just wrapped up, and they are now headed towards the Big Ten tournament. So, Michael, what have you seen from the men's team so far this season? Yeah, I mean, I've seen some really exciting things, especially recently. In their last 10 games, they are 6-2-2. And everything has just improved. The offense, the defense, the midfield, everybody's been stepping up. They've only allowed 12 goals on the season. It's great improvement. Chris Shakes, Femio Odesu locking it down back there. They're doing their jobs. And we cannot forget Peter Mangione, the absolute sensation up top, who not only leads the team in goals with nine, but he also is tied for the lead in assists with four. I mean, this team is just coming together at the perfect time. They are stepping up. They are making plays. They're winning the 50-50 balls. That is one of the biggest things in soccer. And not only that, the entire team is moving up. They're connecting their passes. This isn't like sloppy, you know, kick and run kind of game. They are actually playing great ball, and they're moving together. And if this team continues to play like this, they absolutely could have a chance at winning this Big Ten tournament. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. And the last time we saw them at Jeffrey Field, they were – going against a struggling Detroit Mercy team. And they started off hot with a penalty kick from Peter Mangione in the first five minutes of the game. And for the rest of the half, 
They kind of just looked like they were just there but couldn't get it in the back of the net. They went into halftime up 1-0, to zero, and then would you know it? As soon as they came out of the gates at halftime, two goals in the first 10 minutes from Femi Oedesu and Matthew Henderson knocking in his first collegiate goal. They ended, winning, they ended up winning that game 3-0, to zero, and that was Chris Shake's eighth, and I mean eighth, clean sheet of the season. They played 16 games, so that means Shakes and the defense have shut out the opponent in half of their games this season. I just think that's great, and they're going into playing their first round of the quarterfinal of the Big Ten tournament this Friday at home versus Rutgers. Yeah, I've been super, super impressed with the men's team this year. I mean, I am so excited to see what they do in the Big Ten tournament. I honestly expect them to go really, really far just based on this past season and how good they've done. So now let's go to the other side and let's talk about the women's. Josh, what do you think the women's team have done this year? Absolutely. So we saw them win their first game, their quarterfinal matchup versus Indiana, 3-0 to in the first round of the Big Ten tournament. Last week, they unfortunately lost their first game of the season versus Wisconsin. So now they're 13, 1 and 4, and they're really the powerhouse in Big Ten soccer right now. They have everything going for them. Catherine Asman continues to shine in net, and their offense is starting to pick it up. I think this week when they go to Columbus and play the Iowa Hawkeyes in the semifinals for a chance to go to the Big Ten championship, if they can tack on with some more goals and Asman can stand strong in net, they have a chance to play for another Big Ten championship. Yeah, and you know, Josh, I mean, obviously the biggest thing is that when you suffer a loss like that, you know, first loss of the season, it can kind of be depleting to them. But guess what? They came in, they absolutely dominated Indiana. And that was a game that was really tough weather. I mean, it was raining, it was windy, you know. But guess what? They came in and got the job done. And it wasn't a sloppy game either. They had it from start to finish, from defense to offense. And if they are able to continue at that level, the thing that I was the most excited about was everybody was getting involved. Even Ava Alonso, who scored her first goal of the season, was able to get up into that offense and like that's what you love to see they're still dominating they've only allowed nine goals on the season which is just incredible and when you see this level of completion all around going together you know it's really starting to click for them they're all together it's not just one person scoring the goals you know Caitlin McBean Olivia Borgen they're tied for the lead with six goals this is an all well balanced team and if they keep going like this they have no problem with getting this again yeah, overall, I have been so impressed with the women's team. And just like the men's team, I really see them going far in this Big Ten tournament. I mean, they had an unfortunate loss last week, and it was their first and only loss of the regular season. But they came back the, um, the other day, and they really just played like nothing had even happened. Like, it, they really came out and dominated. And they have the talent, they have the power, and they have the stats to go far. So I see them even potentially going all of the way. The women's team continue with Big Ten tournament play on Thursday night against Iowa. Let's take a look at the aforementioned Nittany Lions Big Ten quarterfinal victory over Indiana. 364 days after beginning its Big Ten tournament championship run, the Penn State women's soccer team began the 2023 Big Ten tournament. Led by many, but not all, of the same players that led them to the title a year prior, the Nittany Lions found themselves as the fourth seed in the Big Ten tournament after a 13-1-4 regular season, which included a 10-1-1 record in conference play. It was an offensive outburst from the Nittany Lions, who scored three goals against the 24th-ranked Indiana Hoosiers. Ava Alonzo got the scoring started in the 21st minute of action before Amelia White added a goal less than four minutes later for a 2-0 blue and white lead. Caitlin McBean added the third and final goal for the Nittany Lions in the 52nd minute on one of her four shots on goal in the contest. McBean matched Indiana's total shots on goal as the Hoosiers finished with four chances on Katherine Asman. Asman, who was the 2022 Big Ten Tournament Defensive MVP, went 4-for-4 four four in stops as she backed up a solid defensive effort. Penn State travels to Columbus, Ohio to take on the Iowa Hawkeyes in the semifinals of the Big Ten Tournament in hopes of replicating that success of a season ago. Well, thank you all. Now, Gianna, the women's soccer team, I mean, they just talked about it. They have been great all season long, and now Big Ten Tournament already picked up one victory. They're going for another on Thursday. What do they need to do, not only for the Big Ten Tournament, but likely the national tournament as well? I think they just have to keep playing their game. They've 
been in this position last year. They be, they were victorious last year in the Big Ten tournament. So, like, they have the mindset of being a championship team. And one player that I want to mention is Kayla McBean. She has been crucial to their offense. She is a clutch player. She really comes out strong in every game if they're down or if they are dominating the whole game. She's always making big plays. So I hope to see that in the tournament and further in the NCAA tournament as well. But the women's team isn't just dominant. The men's team is really dominant. What are your thoughts on them going into Big Ten um, tournament play soon? Well, it's kind of the same thing that you just said about the women's team. They just have to play their game that they've played all season long. They've been solid on the defensive end, and they're getting those clutch goals that the women's team is also getting with Caitlin McBean. The men's team is also getting Peter Mangione, a big reason for their offensive success. But I go to Chris Shakes in that. He has been a brick wall all season for Penn State. And they're going to have to rely on him because you know that Big Ten soccer, you look at the Big Ten tournament first, Big Ten soccer, heavy shot presences. He's faced them all year, and he's been able to do well. He's got to continue that in the tournament for them to have success. Absolutely. Moving indoors, the Penn State women's volleyball team has been facing the heart of their schedule with more and more Big Ten play. Coach Katie schumacher Colley and her team have been tested by several teams but have weathered the storm relatively unscathed. The Nittany Lions had a nine-match home winning streak snapped last week in one of their three blemishes in Big Ten play thus far. That loss came against Purdue just over a week and a half ago, but the match meant Far more than the loss, our Ali Winskowski has the story. Sunday's women's volleyball match against Purdue was Penn State's annual Dig Pink match. The team and spectators wore as much pink as possible to raise awareness about breast cancer and support those afflicted with the illness. October is known as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and many of Penn State's fall sports have a game dedicated to the cause. The first annual pink out actually started in January 2007 at a Ladies Lions women's basketball game. I'm not donning the usual business formal attire as I'm wearing pink sweatshirt in support of the pink out. And in fact, even the lines on the court and the posts of the net were pink as well. Fans could bid on authentic pink jerseys that the Nittany Lion players wore in the match, with all proceeds going towards the Side Out Foundation. 29 jerseys are up for auction and bidding ends October 27th. Head coach Katie schumacher Colley said the big turnout was good to help spread awareness. I know we were, they were, you know, selling these jerseys and things like that, and, you know, the money will go for a great cause and, and hopefully help someone. The Penn State women's soccer team held their pink match on the Thursday before volleyballs. These pink out events are not just limited to Penn State sports, Professional teams sport pink to show their support as well. Senior Cameron Hanna, known for being one of the team's leaders in kills, spoke about what the cause meant to her. Um, I think we all have someone who's affected by breast cancer, like Coach said, so it's important that we get to put on this jersey and wear this color and representing something bigger than just this game or just playing volleyball. It's always great to see the Dig Pink match or the Dig Pink game in the case of some other Penn State sports. Breast cancer awareness is a cause that is so dear and near to so many people. That game had a bigger significance than the outcome, but we do need to talk about the outcome. With that, Sports Night Beat reporters Jackson Tortone and Ali Wenskowski have joined me here at the desk. And you guys were at that game and the game earlier in the weekend. And just take me through the weekend. What went right in the one win and what went wrong in the loss? So we'll start off with their match against Iowa, and things just really went right for Penn State. They shined in that match. They Absolutely. swept them, actually, in three sets. So it, one of the things that was improved for Penn State in this match was their blocking game. They had 12 blocks on the night, and Cameron Hanna actually had a career-high seven blocks, and that just added on to her 12 kills and a 4, .409 hitting percentage. So she was the star of the game alongside Jess Mruzik, who's always a star up there for Penn State. She had 12 kills as well. So I just think that Penn State really shined. They showed what they can do on the court, especially in front of a home crowd. Right. And, I mean, they just had a 8-1 um, conference record after that match, and Iowa still was waiting for their first Big Ten conference win. And fun fact, they're actually 0-44 against Penn State, including the game we're talking about later in the whole history of both programs. So yes, in the uh, Sunday matchup, which was a dig pink game, did not go so well for Penn State. Penn State should have won the game. 
All the sets were pretty close, but they just cannot get the points needed in the right moments. Now, Jess Maruzic still had an amazing game, 27 kills, eight digs. He still did great, but the team overall just wasn't really there. Three hitters were in the negatives. It just was not a great performance for Penn State. It was a hit or miss weekend. That weekend, one win, one loss. And this past weekend, it was the same thing. They traveled to Michigan, and in the state of the Great Lakes, it was another win in game one. It was or match one against Michigan, and then an upset loss to Michigan State on Sunday. How about you two take us through that again? So first game, Michigan went pretty well for Penn State. A four-set win. Cameron Hanna with 20 kills. You know, kind of flipping the script with how Michigan Penn State sports typically go. So it was a good win for them, a good morale boost, as we thought. But later, at, later in the same weekend, we saw it was not so much of a morale boost. Exactly. They had a match against Michigan State. And for Penn State, a lot of sports, they get their uh, big matchup against Michigan, and then Michigan State is more of an easier one. And mm -hmm. that was just not the case with our women or Penn State's women's volleyball team. I mean, they went to four sets against Michigan, and then they went to five sets against Michigan State. And they were down in that fifth set 12 to 7, and then came back all the way to tie it up twice before losing 18 to 16. But that was a loss against an unranked opponent when they're a team in the top 15, 20. Um, in the country, so that was just really not a great look for Penn State. And now they have to bounce back from an upset loss to an unranked team against a team that's not only ranked, but they're, the, they're ranked the highest that a team can be ranked. That's number one Nebraska this weekend. It is at home. It is an 8.30 game. It is the wear white game, so the crowd you know is going to show up just like they do for any Penn State theme event, really any Penn State game, but any Penn State theme event, especially the wear white game. It's going to be an atmosphere. The best team in the country is coming. Now, Penn State, they already got swept by Nebraska once this season. What needs to go right this weekend against Nebraska? They're definitely being tested by Big Ten teams, and Nebraska is number one. And they just beat the former number one, Wisconsin, to become number one. So they really are. Who won, who won the championship in 21 as well. They're a really great team. Mm -hmm. So Nebraska's just shown their stride. So Penn State really has to improve their blocking like they did against Iowa. And they have to utilize that home crowd. I mean, Rec Hall is a great atmosphere. And then I think they should really just watch Nebraska's play, see what they can do to defend it. Yes, it's... So what really went wrong against Nebraska was Nebraska was clearly the better team for sure, but all the sets were pretty close, honestly. Two out of the three were only only losses by three points, and so Penn State was able to stay in it and able to kind of like you know keep up with them. And they actually led set two of that game eight to one, and ended up blowing it. So the potential is definitely there to win. But yes, like Ali said, they need to utilize the home audience and they just need to use their energy and they can probably get a win. Yeah, if you have an 8-1 lead in a set, you've got to find a way to win that Absolutely. set. Maybe not the match, but you at least have to win that one set and come away with at least a moral victory and maybe some momentum. Well, Allie and Jackson, we really appreciate you coming in tonight. The Blue and White are currently ranked number 16 heading into this weekend's matchup against number one Nebraska. And then a second match on Sunday when it'll look to avenge that earlier loss against Purdue. Thank you two for joining me tonight. Now let's go from the west side of campus in Rec Hall to the east side of campus and Pagula Ice Arena. The men's hockey team started off 4-0, but since then they've dropped two of its last three games. Now let's bring in our Anthony Desher and Anna LaCastro, who have had front row seats to the Nittany Lion cooldown. Thanks, guys. The Nittany Lions are in the midst of a homestand where they hold a 2-2 record during the two-week stretch. After splitting with AIC in Alaska Anchorage, Penn State will now begin its conference play against Notre Dame. But before we do that, let's look over what we saw recently from the team. After going an undefeated 10-0 against non-conference opponents last season, the Nittany Lions already have two losses in the column. Anna, what did you see over these last two weeks? Scary start to the season, but let's get into it. So here at Penn State Sports Night, you know we love to talk about Penn State football and how they're a second-half team. Penn State men's hockey has not been a second-half team series-wise so far this season. They've actually been quite the opposite. In that first game at home against AIC, they won 3-2 on Friday, but then went on to fall 4-6 on Saturday. And then over this past weekend, game one against Alaska Anchorage, they won 2-1. And during media, when Guy Gadowski was asked about, you know, his expectations for game two, he said, and I quote, We'll see if we learned our lesson, which clearly they didn't because they ended up dropping that game to 5-6. to six. Now, what I've seen so far is that Penn State has been putting up about double the amount of shots that their opponents have been putting up in each game. In that first AIC game, it was even 45 shots to 12, but the high shot tally is not producing as much success as one might think it would. And this is because 
as we know, shots on goal and shots in goal are two entirely different statistics. So that's my first problem. And the second is that Liam Soulier's performance has been an issue. I am not one to blame the goalie. I don't think you should ever blame the goalie, no matter the sport. And I'm also not saying it's all his fault, because it's not. I am saying that he's typically a key element to this team that really helps them with their success, and he's not been playing like himself, which is hurting them. So I think they really need him back on his feet. Yeah, I know he was a very important part to that run last year where they made it all the way to the regionals in the NCAA tournament. And this team has always kind of had that, you know, thing for, you know, peppering the goalie with shots and what, what would go in, what would not go in. Eventually they would find twine, but it's just a lot different to see them, you know, struggle a bit, you know, against these non-conference teams because they are a ranked team and they are expected to do well in, in those situations. But, I mean, it is so early. There's a lot of stuff to, you know, buff out, but... If it works, you know, it, it'll work. It won't work. I mean, we'll see with this uh, little stretch they're going to have to go on with these Big Ten opponents. And the team has trailed numerous times throughout the season, but always found ways to come back in those contests. And are there any concerns about this team falling behind in those contests or just overall play in general? Absolutely. I think there's definitely concerns about them falling behind if they continue playing this comeback game. Even if you're good at it, which Penn State has shown that they can be, that is never a strategy that you should bank on. It's a risky way to play because mistakes happen and you run out of time, which is exactly what we saw in game two against Alaska Anchorage. Penn State was at a two goal deficit. They managed to earn those goals back and tie it up four to four, then went down again four to six. And they almost closed that gap as well with a fifth goal with 12 seconds left to play. But then unfortunately for the Nittany Lions, you know, that last shot just did not beat the final buzzer and they ended up with another game two loss. So, you know, that's really, I am concerned about them falling behind if they continue to let themselves get down in those games. Yeah, I don't know if it's the loss of talent that we saw over the offseason with Kevin Wall and McMiniman and McEachern all going to different spots in this country, but um, this team is young up front. I mean, they're going to have their struggles. There's a lot of good, talented freshmen. I mean, Aiden Fink's shown, shown some promise. Matt DeMarsico, he's had a lot of confidence so far. And Guy Godowski said that this defensive core is one of the best, if not the best, he's ever seen. So there is a lot of promise here. Um, like, I, like I said prior, there, it is, there is still a lot of time for them to figure this thing out. But finally, they're going to see their first Big Ten opponent this week in Notre Dame. The Fighting Irish have had an up-and-down season themselves. So what do you expect the Nittany Lions to do this weekend? Yeah, so Notre Dame, they split multiple series early on in their season. Most recently, they swept Mercyhurst at home. Um, I actually think this upcoming series is going to be really interesting because Penn State and Notre Dame's post-game reports look like two people cheated off each other's quizzes and just changed the words around a little bit. I mean, in their first game of that series against Mercyhurst, Notre Dame was at a two-goal deficit, and they came back just like Penn State did. And they also put up 54 shots on Mercyhurst's 27, which was their season high. And this is going to be a big problem for Penn State, who so far has lost to teams who can't even come near their shot tally, and now they're going to meet their match in that category. So if they want to win, they're really going to have to, you know, make sure those shots actually cross the goal line. Um, Goaltender-wise, I honestly don't know what they're going to do. I'm figuring they're going to start Soulier, but if he continues to struggle, I really hope they sub him out for Noah Grennan and give him a chance. Yeah, Notre Dame does have talent. They have Cole Knubel. They have the Janikis, the Slaggerts. But really, this team lives and dies by their goaltender, Ryan Bischel, who won Big Ten Goalie of the Year last year. Uh, he had a career-high 52 saves against the Nittany Lions last week, or last, last year, I'm sorry. And it's just going to be up to them to, you know, finally – get through that rebound control that he has and, you know, start this Big Ten conference up on, on the right foot. So it'll be interesting to see what they do Saturday and Sunday. The season is still young, as I've said many times before, and there will be many opportunities to Penn State to get back on its feet. The final dress rehearsal before conference play is finished, and the race to the top has only just begun. For Anna LeCastro, I'm Anthony Desher. Justin and Gianna, back to you. Well, thank you, Anthony and Anna. Here are some of the top plays that our beat reporters have captured throughout their times at games this month. Starting off with field hockey, hosting number five, Iowa. Via Gladio keeps the ball in play, then spins through several defenders before finding the back of the cage for the go-ahead goal. Playing host to Purdue in the dig pink match, Angelina Stark with a dig down on the ground to get the ball to Mac Pedraza, who while off balance, bumps it perfectly to Jess Merzik on the attack for the kill. Aiden Fink on the breakaway gets denied, but Jacques Foucault was right there to tip 
in the rebound for a goal against Alaska. In the same game, Danny Jania finds the puck in the center of the ice after a turnover by Alaska and goes top shelf over the goalie's glove for a Penn State goal. Penn State football hosting Indiana. Denied Dennis Sutton comes right off the edge and forces a fumble on the strip sack. The ball goes out of the back of the end zone for a safety as the Nittany Lions sealed the deal. That's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for tuning into this edition of the Dear Old State Sports Update with many fall sports and postseason action and the next group of teams starting their seasons. Make sure to stay caught up with all things Penn State sports this year by following us on all of our social media platforms. For Gianna Kataya and the entire team here at Penn State Sports Night, I'm Justin Chevalella. Have a great night, and remember, as always, we are Penn State Sports Night. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning into this edition of Penn State Sports Night. For more content like this, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, give us a like, and follow our socials down below. And as always, we are Penn State Sports Night.